have this, this interactive um, uh, application um, that's, that's talking to uh, my, my Beagle ball here. So I didn't have to do any additional programming. I just visit this website and it's actually interacting with the hardware, right? So it's actually turning um, the LED on and off and I can change the, the rate, make it blink faster. Um, so you see the actual LED blinks faster, make it blink slower. Um, where it should detect this, um, I think this button right here. Is it wired up? Am I pressing the right button? Um, we'll do some other stuff with that, but, but you can actually um, do interactions with the, the hardware um, through the, the web page, right? So this is another big difference in the Raspberry Pi is you plug it in, it's ready to go. Um, there are several other, another one, really big difference is there, there are these microcontrollers in there, which I won't, I won't go into right now. Um, but there are these extra microcontrollers that you can do microcontrollers. So there's that you can do really fast I/O things with, right? And this is because essentially this was an industrial control part. Um, that's what the, the the main chip in here uh, comes from. And um, whereas the Raspberry Pi was built from a, a media chip, um, so they have very different sort of characteristics, things that they're optimized for. Both great for learning Linux. Um, but uh, for, for building different hardware interfaces and stuff, um, in some ways this is better. Um, so now I'm mostly going to say the same things over again, um, but slower and kind of diving into to, to each one. Any high level questions or things you'd like for me to, to cover? This is the black. How does this compare with the other previous um, models? So I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll get to, I've got a kind of a, a okay. chart where I'll talk to, I talk to each one. Um, so I'll cover the differences between the other boards. Any other things to make sure I talk about? So it says fifty dollars. Are all the different models fifty dollars? Uh, no, the BeagleBone Black is about fifty dollars. Um, they've been on sale at Micro Center for, for uh, quite a bit for about forty dollars. Um, you see them online from fifty to sixty dollars, um, and different different places. And occasionally you see them on sale cheaper. Um, but the BeagleBone Black is really you know, the popular Beagle board, and it's the most recent one, and it's the one to get. It's the cheapest. Probably don't get the one that's white, right? Don't get the one that's white. The white one's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the, the cool features of the white. Um, we did actually drop a couple things and then add a couple things, um, moving from the white to the black. Um, actually, why don't, I, why don't I hit that one first and come back to some other stuff? Cause Were you involved in the development of the previous models, too? Yes. Um, so I've, I've been, so I, I, I was, I started this, so I'm an employee of Texas Instruments. Okay. Um, so I've been an employee of Texas Instruments for 22 years. Um, I graduated um, a couple years after I started TI um, from Texas A&M University. I grew up in Texas. I moved up to uh, Michigan, um, I think 2010. I don't know, 2009, 2010. So a couple years into the, the, the Beagle Board project. So what part of Texas are they doing this type of stuff? Uh, the, um, the assembly of all these, these boards has been done in uh, Richardson, Texas. So a suburb of Dallas. So that's where our manufacturing partner, Circuit Co., um, has been making them. Um, with the Beagle Ball in Black, um, we brought, we brought an additional manufacturing partner uh, in China. Um, with uh, Element 14, um, but the the price is essentially the same, right? So the the, the guys and and it, because most of this goes into um, machines, right? So you, you, the machines do all the assembly of these boards. So so um, it really comes down more to purchasing power when it comes to getting the price of these things down, yeah. right? But when we built the first Beagle board. Um, so, so TI's whole investment in terms of, of dollars to get all these made um, was twenty five thousand dollars. Really? Um, so at the at the time, I was the, the, the chief technologist for a portable and audio video business, um, which made chips for essentially MP3 and MP4 video players and audio players. Um, and uh, this, we were the first one. Texas Instruments was the first one to come out with the, the ARM Cortex A8 into into a chip. Um, and that's the, the place where arms arm processors. So if you're familiar, x86 processors, you know what they are? So just a few. So some people don't really know much about uh, CPU architectures, but for most um, desktop computers, 
Um, they're generally x86 is the, the architecture type. Um, there's two major manufacturers of x86 computers. There's Intel and there's AMD. Um, I, I think most of the people are just lazy tonight. I mean, we all do want to raise most, their yeah. hands. <laughs> they just didn't raise their hands. Um, We've but, been but, dealing architectures for a long time. But these ARM processors, you know, have been you know, catching up very quickly, yeah. and what they really excel at is doing things at low power. So like, all of your phones in here are, are without exception, I'm, I'm sure, running ARM processors. Um, and, and, and TI was the, the, the leader at the, at the time of um, cell phone processors. Um, and we're looking at taking those cell phone processors and going into to new markets as some of the big um, cell phone guys are essentially in the process of insourcing, right? So Apple now makes their own chips, Samsung makes their own chips. Um, so that market was kind of going away. And for me, that was a golden opportunity to, uh, to go and, and let people have more access to this technology. Um, and so we built this, the first um, Beagle board, we launched in 2008. Um, and, and, and it was kind of a, a bring your own peripherals thing. So we were able to bring the cost down um, of the, the whole thing by saying, well, you plug in a monitor if you want a display, and you plug in a keyboard if you want, you know, USB keyboard if you want a keyboard. And that may sound like really obvious, um, but at the time it, it really wasn't that obvious. Most of the development systems around these these processors um, were several thousand dollars, right? And they include included touchscreen LCDs that you know, were done in low volumes, and they, they included you know custom key panels that were all all done in low volume. Um, so it's stripping all that stuff away so that you can get down to a board that you could just use standard PC peripherals. We're working with an ARM device was actually, you know, completely new at the time. Um, so we, you know, came up with that, right? So Gerald and I sat down over lunch and came up with the concept to make this board targeting Linux developers. And we got TI to give us twenty-five thousand dollars to go spend our first five prototypes. So twenty-five thousand dollars got us five boards. Um, we went to DigiKey. Um, I don't know how many of you heard of DigiKey, but they're an electronics distributor. Um, a really fantastic one out of uh, Thief River Falls, Minnesota. A really thick book. With, yeah, the nice thick catalogs, right? But, but, but they make stuff that anybody can go to their catalog and order, right? So it's, it's, it's really easy to, to go onto the website or go through the catalog, pick up the phone, um, place an order and buy it. So it's really opening up access to, to anyone um, around the world, with, with, with only a few exceptions. and. So, and, and they, just based on the concept and, you know, and, you know, hey, you know, people from TI are behind this and, um, you know, just, just relationships, bought 10,000 um, based on our, our, our five wow. prototypes, wow. right? So they committed to selling, selling 10,000 boards. Um, and that allowed us to get the price, you know, under the, the you know, under 100, 150 bucks. Um, and it, you know, it's getting that sort of upfront commitment that really allows you to bring down the, the, the prices of these things. Um, and, and, and you'll see that that's why, I mean, for the, for the um, like the, the big difference between the Beagle Ball and white here, and it's $89, we're kind of stripping things down, bringing up, um, we're still in the, like, uh, doing batches, we're still in batches of like 20, 20, 30,000 um, for this one. Um, and in between, the, the BeagleBone White and the BeagleBone Black happened Raspberry Pi, which built up awareness for doing these little single board computers tremendously, right? Because they came out and said they're going to be the $25 computer, and you know, started waving, waving that, that banner. Um, and that meant there was a lot more interest in what people could do with these things. And we've been building these in, in essentially lots of 100,000. Um, so if, if you... And, 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 and this price is something like, like this has margin built in. So the, the, the business model is very different between BeagleBone and, and Raspberry Pi. Um, distributors make money. Um, the chip vendor makes money. Everybody makes money. And that's, I think that's the sustainable model. Um, I'd rather everybody in the, the supply chain um, make a little bit of money and be motivated to, to do this um, with some, some longevity. Um, but that's a different model. We don't ask you know everybody not to take any any margin. The margins are still fairly low, but, but we, we give margins um, for everybody. So if you were going to build a hundred thousand boards, um, 
you can produce it cheaper than this. You can undercut us. Sure. Um, and so, so we don't, and we don't use any parts that you can't. Um, you buy through a distributor in quantity one um, that requires an NDA in order to get the data sheets for any of the, the components, right? Because because our goal is, um, you know, being employees of TI, we have the, the casual. Uh, you know, makes it a little bit more casual. It's like, well, you're still going to buy the chips. We can open up this and you make it as, as much as you want. Um, but other, like lots of groups inside of TI have come to me and said, well, we want you to do a Beagle board with this. We want you to do a Beagle board with this. And I say, Are, is the data sheet public? Um, you know, is there, is there an effort to push the support uh, for the chip into the mainline kernel? Um, it, and, if, and if the questions of those are, are no, you said, forget it. It's not Beagle board. Um, and that's um, that's been an, an issue, um, and and you'll have seen um, other like um, efforts come out of TI that, that aren't you know BeagleBoard because you know, BeagleBoard wouldn't do what was you know what they wanted, mm -hmm. um, which was to work with a, not an NDA device or work with some of these things that were on So um, so I've been very fortunate to be able to keep that separated, um, and. The, we don't rely on, on continuing ongoing support from TI. They still pay my salary. Um, don't, don't tell them, but if they stop paying me, I'd still keep doing this. <laughs> um, this is being yeah, I, I'm aware. But, no. um, I think they still like me, hopefully. Um, no, they'll keep me on the payroll. Um, but this is, um, you know, we, we, if, if if TI were to stop supporting this tomorrow, it wouldn't stop shipping rights. We haven't, we, we've gotten you know, my salary, we had Gerald's salary for a long time. He eventually left TI uh, to start his own consulting company, so he now does that um, full time, and he's continuing to do BeagleBoard. Um, and, um, you know, they, there's been some, some marketing support, right? Because, you know, it helps promote TI processors, so they will do some, um, some, some marketing of it. So it's definitely, it's gotten some support from TI, but we don't rely on that for, for uh, their support in order to keep doing the manufacturing and keep supporting um, the community. Um, you got a sense of, well, you probably know how many you've built total? Um, the BeagleBone blocks are probably around 350,000 or so. Um, you know, all told, uh, we're about 600,000, somewhere Pretty between substantial. all the boards. Um, the XM and the Beagle <coughs> Bone, so the, the, like the, the Beagle Bone is the top seller. The XM is, uh, well, the number two seller is the Beagle Bone, but the XM is still selling um, down, mm -hmm. right? It's still doing, uh, you're still continuing to get people ordering and have to continue to build the XMs. Um, um, but the number two runner is still the, the, the Beagle Bone as far as like total sales. Mm -hmm. So this is 2000, 2008. Um, I think this was another like 18 months or so, like in 2010, um, 2011 for the, 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 Beagle, the original BeagleBone, and then 2013 or so for the BeagleBone Black. Um, so the first two, they both included DSPs, and they're both essentially built off of a chip that was really designed to be a, a cell phone chip or a mobile phone chip. Um, so you got you know, media accelerators and other things like like that inside the, the chips. Um, with the Beagle Bone, you know, we focus it was you know it's bare bones, much more about hardware hackers, right? These are very much focused on Linux hackers and people building uh, you know, kernel hackers and people building things off of Linux. Here we try to do, kind of make a, a, a jump in simplicity and really target um, kind of the maker audience or the electronics hobbyist market. So people that may have been playing with the Arduinos in the past. Um, so you'll see a big jump in the number of I.O. pins um, and the inclusion now of these uh, the real-time controllers, uh, built-in A to D converters. The, the features that got dropped going from the, the BeagleBone White to the BeagleBone Black is there's a, there's a USB to serial and USB to JTAG. Um, so JTAG is um, a, a test protocol. It's a, it's a, it's a serial interface, so it's... A, um, Essentially, over USB, you can talk to this JTAG protocol to the chip, and you can send commands to stop the chip's execution. So the processor will sit there and, and just not do anything. Um, and then you can read out the registers 
so you can actually look at the program counter, what, 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 you know, because when a computer runs, right, it's just like execute instruction, next instruction, next instruction, and it always has an address where it's reading those instructions from. So you can actually read what that address is, read the values in memory, so that's fetching. Um, so it allows you to do hardware examination um, within the chip. Um, and there's actually open source software for doing it. You can either use the, the TI uh, tools for looking at all the registers and the memory and everything, um, or you can use um, open OCD, which is an open source uh, uh, package that allows you to do that. But, but this gives you really low level uh, debugging. If you want to do uh, kernel development, this is a really nice feature. Um, if you're just going to use somebody else's kernel, not a particularly needed feature, and that's why you just go to the, the Beagle Black. Uh, so right? Black doesn't have the JTAG. It does. It does have a JTAG connection, but you have to solder it on the back of the board. Okay. Um, but we just removed the, the the chip on there that actually provided a USB to JTAG bridge directly on the board. Gotcha. Um, so this one had a, a physical USB to serial as well, so you can look at the serial console and see all the boot log information <laughs> and all that um, directly over that same USB connection. It actually had a little two-port hub in there. I um, wanted to talk to the FTDI device that was the serial and JTAG, and the other one to talk to the, 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 the SOC, the, the chip. Um, and then this one just talks straight to the chip. There's no little hub in there. I'm probably talking over a few people's heads at this point. I'll try to bring it back down a notch. Um, no, because I can, I can dive deeper. Dive, dive deeper. Oh, I, I think you're at a great level, <laughs> personally. <laughs> um, and because Raspberry Pi had happened, you know, we also had a lot of pressure to include the video interface on there, so we added the, the, the yeah. HDMI. Um, we didn't use a micro HDMI in order to keep it within the same fact form factor. Um, keep all the IOs on the edges which is another nice thing compared to the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, they've got their connectors sticking out all their directions if you want to use it um, in, in industrial equipment embedded. It makes a whole lot nicer cases just have connectors on two, up two ends rather than all four ends. Um, uh, we'll, we'll dive into some more. <coughs> so the, the CPUs, uh, are those uh, proprietary? Uh, the, 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 they are proprietary um, in that um, an ARM processor is a proprietary core from ARM Limited. Um, but it is one that's openly licensable, uh, such as you have lots of different vendors you can buy an, an ARM core from. Uh, the, the PRUs are also proprietary. Those are TI proprietary. Uh, they um, are supported by open tool chains and open assembler. There's also GCC support. For the, for the peer use, it's not yet in mainline, um, but but that it is it is out there. Um, T also releases a free C compiler for the for the peer use. They're pretty simple architecture. The guy that did the the GCC for that um, leveraged one of the synthesizable cores in an FPGA in order to give the um, that that base GCC support. And you said the data sheets are available. Uh, yeah, full data manuals. Um, so I think it's uh, something like a. 6,000 page wow. um, reference manual on the SOC. Um, yep. A PRU is? A programmable real time unit. It's a 32 bit RISC microcontroller um, they're running at 200 megahertz, optimized for low latency I.O. Um, and including it, um, some, some small peripherals that, that are used for like generating shift registers um, and other things for emulating peripherals. So if, if you wanted to create multiple serial ports or create custom protocols, um, it's really easy to do those things. Um, there are implementations of real-time Ethernet, like EtherCAT, um, um, other like Profinet, Profibus, um, but a lot of people do things like DMX, which is a, a protocol for lighting. Um, people do pulse width modulators. So you can create a 25, there's, there's an implementation of 25 pulse width modulators down on the peer view. Um, to give you an idea of some of the <coughs> speed of the interfaces, um, there's a, a project out there called Beagle Logic that uses the peer views to do a, 
100 mega sample per second, 14 channel logic analyzer out of the peer use. So essentially you have these, these tiny little microcontrollers that they're running 200 megahertz. So every other cycle they're going and grabbing a state of 14 pins and shoving it off into memory, the shared memory with the arm, right? So you've got the little peer U's that are on the interface talking to the pins. And you've got the arm that's sharing memory with those little microcontrollers. And it's dumping the data from the pins into that memory. And the arm goes and grabs that um, and either compresses it for storage or does some other processing on it where you can interact with that data. Uh, there's an open source uh, set of logic analyzer software called SIGROC, S-I-G-R-O-K. Uh, and there's, there's patches in the main line of SIGROC to support this Beagle logic, um, logic analyzer. So essentially you can do protocol analysis, you can learn about SPI and IGC, and all these fun, crazy, <laughs> embedded serial buses. So if you want to add that experience, you can use that sort of um, visual tool to help understand what's going on in the hardware um, and actually give you a higher level understanding of the protocol. So SIGROC. Can any of this do analog to digital conversion? There's built-in um, analog to digital conversion. Um, there's a, a seven channel, a 12 bit um, A to D um, pins brought to the header at um, 200 uh, kilo samples per second. Sorry, 200 kilo Kilos, kilos samples per second, so so 200,000 samples every second. Um, I think that's over all the, that's if you're capturing in all the different channels, you can make it faster, I think, if you narrow down the number of channels you're capturing. So audio sampling and stuff like that. Yeah, if you wanted to do some audio or you wanted to do, um, like it, it's it's particularly optimized for touch screen. So, uh, um, so it'll actually generate interrupts if you'd like the voltages drop below a level so you can actually do uh, touch screens. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to you know, simply do a, a, a analog sensor like a, a light sensor or a, you know, a pressure sensor, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, are very easy to do, right? So you can just plug in um, like a, a, a TMP35, I think is a, a, an analog temperature sensor um, read back the, the voltage coming out the pen, and you, you can know the temperature. Um, thermistors. Um, I'll get. I'll dive into some of what people are actually making out of these things. Um, so maybe that's something that's easily missed as we kind of dive into some of the, the deeper parts of this conversation. Um, here's kind of the bullet list of the features. Um, this is an eye chart. I don't want to spend too much more time kind of in this deep dive, but if you miss something, there's a there's a micro SD card that you can boot off of, but there's also eight gigabytes of onboard flash. I'm sorry, four gigabytes of onboard flash. Um, that's that's pre-programmed with Debian. Um, lots of I/O. Um, if you don't know about all these different you know, PWM, SPI, I2C, they're what you use to hook up. Um, <coughs> digital <coughs> sensors and digital actuators, right? So an actuator would be something like a motor or a, a, a relay. Um, and uh, you know, a sensor would be something like a, an sorry, altimeter, um, a temperature and pressure sensor. And so all these different types of sensors speak these different protocols. Mm -hmm. And Linux, I mean, the, the amazing and wonderful thing about Linux is Linux just turns them all into files. Um, so say I have this a Bosch a BMP 085, well, you know, well, I don't know what that is, right? So it's a pressure and temperature sensor. There's a Linux kernel driver um, for a, a BMP 085. And all I do is, is write into a file that I'm, I want to talk over I squared C to a, a BMP 085 with this address off this I2C bus, and then two files show up. One, what's the temperature input, and the other is the pressure input. And I just read those files, and any time, you know, I can know what the temperature and pressure are, because I've hooked up the sensor, and I've got the Linux kernel driver for that. Um, and the number of sensors being supported by Linux is always, is always growing. Um, and then if I don't have support for a particular sensor, there are different interfaces that I could use to just talk over these protocols and kind of build up my own driver. Um, but, but the best way is to do it with the Linux kernel driver. Um, so I, I would highly recommend you look for things supported by Linux kernel drivers. Mm -hmm. 
What's the max size of the micro SD card you can use? Uh, the maximum size of the micro SD? Yeah. Um, I know that we can do 64 gigabytes. Um, I'm not sure what much beyond that. I, I don't know any the, what the new standards are to go beyond 64 gigabytes. Um, but you can do that. If you want to do a lot more than that, I recommend going over USB. It's got a USB host on it. If you want to hook up a, you know, four terabyte, um, yeah. you know, RAID array or something, if you want over USB, that you can do that here. Um, it's it's high speed USB 2.0. 64 is good. And um, <coughs> so that's that's a way to get more storage um, than what you can do over micro SD. The, the onboard, the onboard <coughs> MMC is essentially an SD card interface, but it has uh, twice as many data lines, which does make the interface faster. Um, another reason we use it is because of the reliability. Um, a lot of these micro SD cards are not particularly designed for embedded systems. They're just designed for like cameras, and you take a picture and you write to it very, you know, on occasions. You know, just continue running, reading, and writing off or randomly over and over again. Um, whereas these EMMC's flashes are designed for embedded systems, designed for this type of use. Um, and you see that both in the performance as well as the reliability. We can get numbers on the reliability of these these flash. Whereas you get these random micro SD cards, you just don't know. And we've seen a lot of issues with counterfeit micro SD cards, um, where they say one brand, but they're not. Um, so so it's, it's difficult to just always know that, if you, hey, if you buy this brand, it's good. Nine times out of 10, it will be. Um, and then all of a sudden, you get on a, a bad streak of getting bad cards. Um, so having that, having that built-in flash not only gets you the out-of-box experience, it gets you that reliability, longevity. Um, this is kind of the default configuration. Because we essentially use the same pinout as the BeagleBone White, um, and the, the HDMI interface is what's called virtual CAPE. So CAPE is just another annoying word for daughterboard. Everybody has their own terminology for daughterboard. Arduino had the shields. Um, we decided to call them CAPEs. Raspberry Pi came along after and decided they were going to call theirs hats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got a name, um, but the, the HDMI that's on here, essentially, if, if it's if it's turned on, it's going to use these pins, these these orange pins. Um, the, the three over there for the audio, um, and then these over here for the for the video out. <coughs> um, so you have to turn off the HDMI if you want to reuse all the, these different I, the orange I/O pins. Um, in the wrong place. Um, yeah. 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 <coughs> so, I want to, questions, I want to start talking about how people are using these things. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few hundred projects up on BeagleBoard.org slash project. Um, so I encourage if you've done a BeagleBoard project for you to register yours up there. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place to kind of find ideas about what you can, you can do. They, they kind of group down uh, a little bit into some of these areas. Um, uh, medical applications, um, what I'll call citizen scientist sort of applications where people are doing environmental monitoring um, or exploration. Um, they're, they're going out and, and collecting a bunch of sensor data. Maybe it's um, uh, the radiation levels, um, maybe maybe it's uh, uh, you know pollution, other types of pollution levels. Um, they might be you know doing some some time lapse photography of you know like, uh, moon phases. Um, you know, all, all I, I don't know, they, but they but they use this for automation and, and essentially studying the world. Um, there's home automation is a huge application area. Um, and, and not just um, so if it's it's acting as a gateway. So a lot of a lot of just like switches in your home um, might have like different um, electrical or wireless protocols, and they use it as a, a bridge device. So I don't know if, how many of you heard of Z-Wave? Not too. Okay. Oh, actually, more than I thought. But almost almost a quarter of you, or maybe a third of you, heard of Z-Wave. So it's. Um, <coughs> 
it's a it's a, a wireless protocol that you can use for a lot of home automation things. But you have to have something to talk it, right? So you have yeah, to have either controller. a control panel or a remote control or something else that's actually going to speak that protocol. Um, well, if you wanted to, to actually control it through a web page, or right, you put a beagle ball on a, on a on a you know runs a web server, um, it ships with the web server on it. It ships with Apache and Node.js.